Joining me now from Capitol Hill is Congressman Paul Ryan, the chairman of the House Budget Committee and the man being labeled the grown-up in the room who played a major role in working out this compromise. Uh, Congressman Ryan, thanks so much for joining us. You and Senator Murray have succeeded here in coming up with a proposal where other bipartisan duos before you have failed. So I know it hasn't passed yet. It hasn't become a law yet, but you did come up with a compromise. Mm -hmm. what, what's the secret? Allowing yourself more time to deal with each other, setting low expectations, never going to bed angry. What's the advice for future negotiators? Actually, all of the above. All of those are pretty good pieces of advice. We, we decided from the outset, uh, number one, to talk a lot, get to know each other, um, keep our emotions in check. The other thing was we wanted to make sure that we didn't demand or insist that somebody, that the other person had to violate a core principle, that we would instead look for where the common ground exists. So we basically took all of our budgets, ours including the president's and the Senate budgets, kind of overlapped them all and then looked through that prism to see where the common ground existed. Then we solicited other ideas from our colleagues to see if we could get common ground, add that up, and see what that would do with respect to replacing the sequester. Look, the sequester is sort of an across-the-board approach. We think that's crude. That doesn't let Congress set priorities. So we wanted to see if we could find smarter spending cuts in other parts of government. And there's a lot of government that's on autopilot spending that has just not been attended to by Congress. And that's where we got that additional set us those additional spending cuts. So basically, we came up with $85 billion of savings from what we call mandatory spending uh, to pay for $63 billion of some relief from the sequester. Um, we still keep the fiscal discipline. We still keep on track. And this will actually result in more deficit reduction. Um, that's very important to me, to my Republican colleagues. Uh, Patty got a lot of the things that she wanted, and neither of us had to give up a core principle to get this, and that's how we were able to achieve this, I think. So speaking of your Republican colleagues, you just uh, a few hours ago met behind closed mm -hmm. doors with conservatives at the Republican Study Committee, which meets every Wednesday, where you tried to sell this plan. These are the most conservative members of the House Republican Caucus. How did that go? What were their well. concerns? Yeah, it went very well. Uh, it went very well with, with not only the RSC, but also our House Republican Conference this morning. Um, a lot of members were very excited and pleased that we actually have an agreement, that we found a way to make this divided government work. We have basically a broken, divided government. We would like to make it work. This prevents future government shutdowns from happening either in January or October. Um, and what a lot of my members, uh, my colleagues were pleased with is that we're taking the power of the purse and bringing it back to Congress. When we pass these continuing resolutions every year like we've done for the last three years, we're basically ceding the lawmaking power to the executive branch and we're reclaiming that. That, we think, is a very good step in the right direction, and that allows Congress to actually prioritize spending, something we haven't done for like three years around here. And so those things were very, very attractive to our members. And the fact that we have excessive savings, which results in net deficit reduction, and that there isn't a single tax increase in this, is what made most of our members very pleased. Still a lot of criticism from people like Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Rand Paul. It doesn't sound like the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is going to support this. Are you going to ultimately have the votes to pass it? We will. We, we feel good about that. We feel good where we are. Um, we're in the majority. We have to govern, just like Patty, Major Patty Murray is in the majority, and she has to govern. Um, you, you can't get everything you want, but you can get things done if you focus on that common ground area. Um, I'm not going to begrudge anybody who, who, for one reason or another, chooses not to vote for it. These things aren't perfect, but we think this is a step in the right direction. Look, we have laid out our vision very clearly, Jake. Our budget, which balances the budget and pays off the debt, is our vision. It's ultimately where we want to go. But we know in divided government, we're not going to get that. So the question that we're asking is, can we get a step in the right direction? I clearly think this is a step in the right direction. Others would like us to go farther in that right direction. I don't begrudge them of that. I want to go farther in that right direction. But I think this is a step in the right direction, and that's why I think this is very important that we do this and also just show that we can make this government work a little bit. When you talk about you want to go farther in the direction of deficit reduction, a lot of the critics out there, a lot of the conservative groups say this kicks the tough decisions down the road. I don't think that you would even dispute that necessarily in terms of uh, the big budget items that are causing uh, the national debt and the annual right. Uh, right. deficits. Does your having worked with Patty Murray give you any confidence that those big decisions that would probably necessitate both of you violating core principles, that there's any solution there to be had. You know, I'm going to focus on this right here, Jake, this moment, getting this done, making this Congress work. Um, the reason I hesitate to even speculate is because the President and the Senate Democrats have never once ever proposed to balance the budget, let alone reduce the debt. Um, our budget does balance the budget, and it, does, it pays off the debt, ultimately. And so we are so far apart on that issue. 
uh, you have to deal with entitlements, the big entitlements like Medicare and Medicaid that are primary drivers of our debt, let alone Obamacare. Um, you have to take those on. You have to reform those programs in order to prevent a debt crisis to balance the budget. I've shown, we've shown in our budget exactly how we would propose to do that, but we simply do not have much interest from the other side to do that. So I don't know if there's movement on that side to bridge that gap, but you can't tax your way out of this fiscal problem. You have to reform entitlements to do that. Uh, we've offered entitlement reforms in these negotiations and every other way we could conceivably do so. Um, there just doesn't seem to be much take up and interest on that. But I, I don't want to make that spoil this moment, which is just getting us to common ground, Sorry. getting this government work. So Sorry to be such a spoiler. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jake. That's kind of my role. So but let me ask you about some criticisms from the left. Many Democrats are balking at this deal because it does not include uh, extending unemployment benefits. They say that's 1.3 million people who face being cut off at Christmas. Why not include it? Well, there are a lot of things people wanted in here that aren't in here. They wanted farm bill things in here. They, they wanted stimulus spending in here. They wanted a tax increase in here. There are a lot of things that they wanted in here that we just weren't going to do. And we're basically passing an agreement that we can pass, that we can agree to. Um, there was no offset requested for that. You know, that's $20 billion that would have shot a hole right through our deficit reduction. So, look, there are a lot of things that are not in this agreement that people wanted in the agreement. And that's just the way, you know, compromise and common ground works. Another criticism from the left, this package does not include closing a single tax loophole, yet right. it would increase TSA fees that all Americans pay. So what do you, how would you respond to a critic the next time you're having a town hall in Wisconsin who says, why are you in favor of what is, by any other name, a tax increase on middle class Americans? This not, a increase, tax. not a tax at all, it's a user fee. The uh, user fee, we, the we, TSA, so. well, you call it whatever you want, but the, I'm... Pretend I'm being okay. Joe Blow in Wisconsin here. Okay. And I say, you're making me pay more at the TSA. Okay, Jake, I'm going to pretend you're a Wisconsinite and I'm in a town hall meeting. That's Be exactly. Okay, before 9-11, yeah. the person getting on an airplane paid for all of their security when they paid for their ticket. They covered all of it. Since 9-11, that person is, is paying for less than 40% of their security. And the non-flying public, the non-flying taxpayer is subsidizing the rest of it. We think that the user should pay for the services that they're using instead of making some hardworking taxpayer that never uses those services paying for it. So this, and here's what this fee does. It says, if you are, have a connecting flight, you pay five bucks. If you have a direct flight, you pay $2.50. We're saying just do five across the board. And then there was this tax on airlines that was, that was distributed in a very strange way, not treating them the same. And we get rid of that tax, and that is added to this fee. So it's $5.60 a ticket, whether you're connecting or whether you're flying direct. We, and it helps defray the cost of the security. And even with this, Jake, that general fund taxpayer who never gets on an airplane is still subsidizing that person who does fly on an airplane. All right. If I'm a Wisconsinite, I'll take that, I'll take that just because I only have one further question, and that is, it's obviously easier to say no and criticize a, a deal like this than it is to say yes, but are you at all concerned that this deal could hurt you with grassroots Republicans should you ever need grassroots Republicans yeah. to support you in the future? People ask me that kind of question all the time. Um, gosh, if you compromise, isn't that going to hurt your personal political career? Look, if I think like that, then we're going to get nothing done. Look, I was elected by people in Wisconsin to solve problems here. I'm the chairman of the budget committee, so my colleagues have asked me to be a leader in helping solve problems. And if I cloud my judgment by what is good for me politically or not, or how does this help me juxtapose against somebody else, that's just not right in my opinion. So I'm going to do what I think is right, what people in Wisconsin elected me to do, and what my colleagues asked me to do, and I'm not going to let any personal political consideration down the road cloud that judgment, because I quite frankly just don't think that's right. And then with respect to the future, I'll just let the chips fall where they may, and I'll sleep really well. All right. Congressman Paul Ryan, I hope you, your wife, and your beautiful children have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you so much for you being too. with us. Thanks.